welcome you to this very special meeting of our International Baptist Friends Meeting and World Mission Conference. God bless you for being here on this day and this morning especially. I want to greet the friends who are joining us who are part of our Shepherd Summit each week. There are now 1,640-something pastors across the world uh, in every state and over 40 countries around the world who are enlisted to be a part of this. And so when we have these special meetings and we happen to have them on a Tuesday, we invite them to have a part in all of this. So let me greet them. And if you'll be patient with me, I'll say a little word about them a little later in the meeting. But I'm glad they're here, glad they're joining us. And uh, we have people coming on and it takes a while sometimes for them to get everything ready and get everything fixed so that they can join with us. And we're pra pra praising God for that. I got news this morning that our friend, uh, Jesse McBride, went to be with the Lord. We've been praying for him. I had an opportunity to talk to him by phone just a few days ago, and he was able to communicate. But we love him, and now he's with the Lord Jesus. And we thank God for him and for his life and ministry, for his love for us. I'll say more about that in just a bit. I want you to stand with me, please. We're going to pray and ask God's blessing on our meeting. And I want to encourage you not only to pray for this meeting, but to pray for Jesse's mother, Beverly, who's a good godly woman and has been with her son, encouraging him caring for him all through this ordeal with his cancer. But he's the victor and the victor is in the Lord Jesus. Let's pray, may we? Our fathers, we come before thee, we thank thee, Lord, that thou art greater than all our need. And the last measure of grace we receive in its greatest way is the measure we'll receive when we close our eyes in this world and go to meet thee face to face. We thank you for the promise that thou art with us, never to leave us, never to forsake us. And we give you great glory for this. We thank you, Father, for the assurance we have and the calm that comes because of our faith in thee that all is well with thee. We pray for this dear family going through this loss, which is his gain. Oh, Father, bless them and bless this meeting and use us for thy glory. Help us to understand anew and afresh with deeper, deeper meaning why we are doing what we are doing and why we give ourselves the way we do to thy work. Take this meeting where it pleases thee to go. Do a mighty work in our hearts. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. There are a number of things we're gonna follow along as we always would in a meeting, so we're gonna find our crown hymn book and turn to hymn number 344. Glory to his name, as Brother Stephen comes to lead us.
singing. Thank you. You may be seated. And we're always happy to have the Crown College Choir singing. And their songs yesterday were such a blessing. And they're singing a couple of songs now that we trust will encourage our hearts. God bless you, choir.
that was a blessing. Would you say amen this morning? Praise the Lord. Let's take our hymn book and turn to hymn number 341. And let's all stand together and sing this wonderful hymn, I Have Found a Friend in Jesus. Hymn number 341, all together. I have found a friend in Jesus. Thank you so much. You may be seated. We're going to do something a little unusual. We're receiving an offering, and our men are coming now to make sure we're ready for that. A little later, we want you to make sure that you have the special brochure for the International Baptist Friends Meeting. And for some of you who are watching 
in the Shepherd Summit, you may want us to send you a copy of that. We'd be thrilled to do it. So just let us know. You have our email address, and uh, we didn't want to just send it out indiscriminately to everyone. But I'd like for you to request what's going on here and to be a part of it. And we're going to ask the ushers to have a seat and in the front just for a moment because instead of having someone play for the offering, we're going to receive the offering in just a moment. Mr. Zinker will come and lead us in prayer. But we're going to play a recording of Jesse McBride singing, I Am a Poor Wayfaring Stranger. Uh, this was done quite a while back with our Crown College Choir. Uh, Earl Holloway is the man who was leading our choir and discovered that Jesse could be trained to sing. And uh, I heard him, <laughs> there was so shocked, beautiful voice. God used him in a great way and he became a favorite here singing. Uh, we have missed him. He's been battling cancer for a long time. Once we thought we had a reprieve from that and he came back for a little while, established a great testimony with us, but then started suffering with this disease again. So I want you to listen quietly and to him singing and praying God will speak to your heart. But then also, may God use it to remind us that we're just here for a while, all of us. We're just passing through, we're on a journey. And we have an inevitable meeting with God and we ought to be preparing for that all the time. I'm gonna have Mr. Zinger come and lead us in prayer and then uh, we'll have the lights out. The gentleman will begin when he starts the song to receive the offering. Would you please bow with me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we can come on this day and we can hear of thy goodness we are thankful for thy faithfulness to us. Help us as we prepare to give. May we give with generosity. May we give with faith, believing that what we give today will be used to advance thy glory and the gospel around the world. We're thankful for this reminder from our friend, Jesse McBride, that we are just strangers and pilgrims here in this world, that we have a very limited time to do what we will do. Help us not procrastinate help us not put off what we should do but may we obey even today speak to us today by thy spirit help us and may this offering go to further thy work around the world in Jesus name
truly love that boy and we'll see him again. We want to keep praying for his mother. Early, early this morning, he went to be with the Lord. And we're going to make that journey too. All of us. And he's left this good testimony with us. I hope it'll be used of God to wake some of us in a way that we'll yield to the Lord what we've yet to yield to the Lord. I've asked our guest speakers to be here to answer some questions and I'm just going to ask them some questions and let them have the mic and I want them to uh, just tell us what's in their heart. It's important to me that we make this personal. I mean by that, uh, Tim Hawes and his wife are serving the Lord in Papua New Guinea. And uh, I remember when he came here as a student and he distinguished himself as a Christian never anything loud or bombastic, nothing, just steady, sold out to God. God's blessed him with a wonderful wife. I remember when Adarsha came. He came from Kathmandu, Nepal, and a wonderful Christian young man. He was given to the Lord in such a way, everybody knew he was just going to do whatever God wanted him to do. And he came from a great home. Father was a pastor there. And then Kendall Wadley. Kendall Wadley was a young man who has quite a testimony uh, from birth growing up in this part of the country. And when Kendall came to us, uh, he was in a sense the life of the party and always sincere as a Christian. God's blessed him with a wonderful wife and family. We give God the glory for that. Derek Moreland was trained here also and uh, answered the call of God with a willingness to go to England, married a great girl. I've known her since she was born and uh, I knew her daddy over, he's with the Lord now, but oh, more than 40, 45 years ago. But God led them together and they've done amazing work for God, not just in Oxford, England, where he serves, but God has used them to open doors throughout Europe. And uh, I'm gonna ask just a few questions and I'd like for them to give as short answers as possible. But let's begin with saying, uh, Tim, why don't you tell us how you had confirmed in your heart that of all places in the world, where some people say is a God-forsaken place and full of demonic activity and Papua New Guinea, how did you know God was calling you there? My first trip I did there for my internship was just two weeks. I went there, did my internship, and to be honest, it was a very difficult two weeks. There were many difficulties. I saw many of the Difficulties of serving the Lord in Papua New Guinea firsthand. And to be perfectly honest, I came back to the, the U.S. I said, Lord, if you want me to go back, I will go back, but please don't send me back. <laughs> that, is, that is honestly what I prayed. And I came back, I prayed, and the Lord opened the door for me to go back again. And that was a real struggle in my heart. But when I went back the second time, that's when the Lord confirmed to my heart that it was Papua New Guinea. He wanted me to serve there, and he's been faithful ever since. Why do you think that internship was something that God gave you to open your understanding, to help you see the reality of it? If you're going to serve the Lord there, it was the real thing. Yes, sir. I really think God just wanted me to fully surrender to him. And he used that. Yes, sir. Good. Adarsha was born in Kathmandu, Nepal. It's a place we only imagine exists in this unique part of the world but he grew up there. And you can imagine how we felt when God sent us a young man from that part of the world 
to study here, we knew all along he was going back to Kathmandu. And we just had a limited time to influence his life and to train him and to help him. But uh, even for me, the things God has put in his heart, the vision God's given him about a school and training workers and being strategically positioned between two large countries, China and India, um, God has done a unique work. And so going back to your father and to that work, um, how did you know, having confirmed to you, this was God's unique place for you? Yes, sir. When I graduated from Crown in 2015, there were some friends from Crown who went with me to Nepal. And uh, originally, I was planning to come back for a master's. I had a return ticket. I-20 was all done and everything was ready. All I had to do was get on the plane and come back to the States. But um, so staying here at the Crown and studying the Word of God, God had really worked in my heart. And when I went back home, I saw Nepal, my own country, differently. You know, I grew up in Nepal and Kathmandu and, and all that, but it was different this time. And um, I told my dad, uh, I'm going to stay here and uh, we need to start a Bible school. You know, I had the opportunity to go to U.S. and get the Bible training. But not all of these young people from Nepal will have that opportunity. A lot of paperwork and visa and finance and all that. And, and I remember pastor emailed me, you should come back and finish a master's. And, and I had to say, pastors, I'm staying here. And, and I really believe that God wanted me to stay here. And just the word of God that, that I learned here at Crown and God working in my heart through his word while I was at Crown. It was amazing how it just changed my view and... <laughs> and in all that. Is well, you did finish the master's, yes, but sir. a little different way, finish it here. God has used you in a great way. And we just knew that the Lord had his hand on your life. We want to do all we can to help you and encourage both of you. We feel so strongly about. And uh, I'm honored that you represent the Lord and what we've been trying to do here at Crown College. Now, we must have a, a little different perspective with Kendall. <laughs> Kendall is the type of fella uh, you won't have a great time with, and um, he's always been that type of person wanting to be around. But my wife and I have discussed time and time again how God has used this young man beyond anybody's imagination. He took on the whole country of Canada uh, for his burden and for his field, and um, You've told us a little bit about why God, how God dealt with you to get to Canada. Uh, many people talk about the need of Canada. We'll talk about that with all of you in a moment. But how did you know it, this is it? This is it for me. Really, I was raised here in this area, and so it was very easy to go to church, and, and lots of churches had lots of people in them. And so I was challenged when I was a student here to go on the Crown College choir trip to the UK. I went to the UK, and then after I graduated, went there for a time. That's really where the Lord worked on my heart, really through uh, sometimes uh, do, going things, going about things in a comfortable way, and Mr. Zinker was used by the Lord and Pastor Sexton to, to help, help me, push me forward, and get out of my comfort zone a bit. So I was there about 18 months. And then I finished a master's degree here while I was here. Uh, really, the passage in the Bible that spoke to me was in Luke 14, verse 25. It says, There went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, and children, brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And I met my wife, as I told you on Sunday, in Canada. Never had plans to go there. And it wasn't about the field of Canada. It was about what God wanted me to do with my life. And so the burden of pioneering, I just saw this is the time that God wanted me. God actually placed me in Canada, and now I'm going to go about following him to reach the country for Christ and reach every region. That's Amen. Right. Now, Derek Moreland is another one of these young men who's always been outstanding since he hit the ground. We knew something special was going on in his life. And... Um, 
the Lord has given him the most wonderful girl as a wife. Uh, tell us how many children God's blessed you with, mm -hmm. and you're expecting another one right away. Yes, we have six children. Number seven is to be born in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> and he, his wife is such a great girl, and I've known her all of her life. So you were uniquely serving God with Brother James in England, and the work was expanding. We wanted to keep expanding it. But how did you settle on the fact that maybe you just willing to do whatever he asks you to do, but how, how is it God put you in Oxford and you feel that's where the Lord wants you? I struggled, I think, for like many young people, knowing where God would have me. And it was in England that I learned a principle that Pastor Sexton had taught us, but oftentimes we hear things at Bible college or at church that goes in one ear and out the other. But I learned that God was not necessarily calling me to a place, but to a work. Christ said, I must work the works of him that sent me. The Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I've called them. And it was more about a work than about a place. And when I understood that, then all these other options, there are always, there are always options, all these other options sort of fell through the cracks and the work that God had called me to uh, rose to the surface. And as long as I'm busy about that, then I'm, I'm happy, quite happy. Well, I think it's wonderful how the Lord has used each of you now, you are where God wants you to be. You have confidence that God is with you there and he's enabling you. There's no doubt in my mind about that. But I want you to think as you're speaking to people now, how would you say people could be used of God, certainly praying for you. We, we don't want to take things for granted. And, but how could you appeal to people about the work of God that needs to be done in your particular region? There couldn't be more difference between where you are and difference in New Guinea, Nepal, Canada, and England. But how can people be used of God? You're recruiting people, in a sense, talking to them about how the Lord could use them. What, what, what needs to be done in your area? Tim, let's start with you. Yes, sir. There's a great need in Papua New Guinea for laborers. Because of the 800 languages, the culture is very, many different cultures are represented by those 800 languages. They're separated by the mountains. So there's many, many people that need to be reached with the gospel. The government, I didn't mention it last night, but the government actually requires the Bible clubs, requires religious instruction in the public schools. So we have total freedom to go in and teach the Bible clubs. But I personally don't believe that door will be open for very long. There's a lot of influence with China and even with our visas, different things are changing. And I really think that door is only open for a short time. And the chance to reach the children is this moment in time. So there's a great need for people to teach the Bible clubs. There's a great need for practical skills. As I said, we're a developing country. So any of the basic practical skills, mechanics, carpentry, all those things, the door is wide open to do training and teaching the local people. And it's a great way to reach the men there. So if you've been trained, if you're trained, for instance, here, you could be duly trained with a Bible foundation and also educational instruction to be an educator. Uh, you happen to work with linguistics. Uh, be a little specific about some of those things. You say, this person, we need to take some work in linguistics if you're going to be there or whatever. Okay, yes, sir. So as far as the practical skills, the door is open. If you just came even, say, for two weeks, what we've done in the past, we had a carpenter come. He came for two weeks. He did the practical, just taught how to do a profile for a house, how to do basic things like that. We did anything that needed explanation. We did explanation in the language, and then we would teach a Bible lesson, give the gospel presentation. But then after that, many of those men were able to reach and start bringing into the church. So... For a short-term trip, there isn't much requirement for linguistic study. If you come long-term, there's great open doors even for Bible translation and for their linguistic study. Yes, there's many open doors. Well, do you know the thing that makes Crown College Crown College is we require a Bible foundation for every major. No matter what you may be studying, it might be uh, welding in the 
trade school or whatever, but you have to have so many hours of Bible to give a Bible foundation. And it seems to me that this, this is a, a way we know it's a great foundation. You may have someone who's a mechanic, but they can also teach the Word of God and they know certain principles about the Word of God and using God's Word. How, how do you feel about that foundation? Yes, sir. And with so much in missions, it's all the Lord, and it comes back to your heart with God. We can have someone that comes over that's a mechanic, but if they don't have a heart for God, it bears absolutely no fruit. And the door is wide open. If you're someone that God has saved, you have a heart for God, a love for God, missions, and you're willing to give that skill to God, God can use it in a great way to reach people. Well, we're working right now, right now, to make sure that all of our graduates in education can teach in any area. They can teach in a public school. They can teach in a private Christian school. They can teach in a charter school. They can teach in a school co-op. They can teach in a home school. So when they're getting that degree in education, we want them to have, have the tools to go anywhere in the world and teach in any forum. And I think that's the proof that it needs to be done. Yes, sir. God bless you. Now, Art Arsha, how can people, you know, you think about who in the world would go to Kathmandu and, um, unless they want to climb Mount Everest. But anyway, uh, tell us a little bit about how people could help the ministry there. Yes, sir. So we're trying to do three things right now. And one is to rent a land and build cabins on that. And so we would love any help, any builders who would come over and help us do that. And we need to do that before this summer. And the second thing is we want to start a summer camp. And I worked at Mount uh, Moriah Camp one summer. That was a big blessing. And, and uh, young people in Nepal haven't experienced that yet. And I think it would be a great encouragement to them. And thirdly, uh, we're praying for a Christian school. And we're praying somebody from here would come and help us start a Christian school. We have two boys and we don't want them to go to public school. Every school in Nepal has a Hindu temple. And they push Hinduism and, and all kind of things are coming there as well. So those three specific things I would say. Well, now, you know, we have camps. Uh, Crown College has Crown Camps. We have a camp in Montana at the, the Passage, we call it, the Passage Northwest. A beautiful 120-acre property. And God is using that. It keeps developing. We have wonderful people leading that. We have a camp in Texoma in Texas. And the people do internships there, and we thank the Lord for it. Uh, we have Camp Victory in England, and so when people are studying there abroad, they can get the experience in that camp. And then we have our camp here, Mount Moriah, where you, you worked. So getting those experiences, understanding those things can be used there. What about Canada? What Canada's wide open, I understand. Now, we... We always talk about closed countries and closed things. We've had a, a new and exciting thing happen in Canada. Now we can travel to Canada freely to and from Canada, correct? Yes. Um, the border has been closed between the U.S. and Canada for almost well, over two years since March 2020. So about two months ago, well, about a month ago, the border opened wide open. So you don't have to have any requirements other than a current U.S. passport or another international passport to enter into Canada. So the door is wide open. Now, the thing is, is we don't know how long that door is wide open for, but we want to take advantage of that. Amen. And what we're trying to do is establish a Crown Extension from Crown College in Canada to do the same type of thing we're doing in England and other places around the world. So you pray. We need some housing for young people, and they can spend semesters there, and I think it's going to work wonderfully well. Now, Derek, how can we help in England? How is things expanding? What, what are some of the unique things God's done to open doors? You, you think you're in Oxford. That's a part of England, a part of the United Kingdom, but it's a gateway to other places. What are some of the things, exciting things that have been happening there? That's right. Uh, England is a part of the United Kingdom. There are four countries in the United Kingdom. God has opened a door in Wales. That's the first church plant in Wales just over the border. We have a church plant that was started here in June on the border of England and Scotland, so we're expanding that way. But we've also been given a great open door in the Netherlands. I can be in, in the Netherlands within a couple of hours. 
uh, by the, either by plane or by ferry. I can drive to Dover, two hours from Oxford, hop on a ferry, be in Calais, France in an hour and a half, and then drive up another hour and a half to the Netherlands. And we've just started going once a month to the Netherlands to hold a gospel meeting on a Friday night and a teaching session for believers on a Saturday morning. We believe God has opened a door there. We're trying to follow him at his pace. Now, we've visited Paris four times in the last couple of years, praying about an open door there. And uh, doors are just opening. We can get anywhere in Europe within a couple of hours from England. And England has always been that sort of gateway, not just to the United Kingdom or even to Europe, but in many ways to the world. So we're in a very strategic place. We always say this is for that. In other words, what we're doing, this is for that. We're doing this, whatever this is, but we ought to look beyond whatever this is and see what God is leading us to help us do. And I can see that you gentlemen have gotten a hold of that and you're pressing on and we give God the glory for that. Now, they're going to be here for the entire conference. They have opportunity to talk to you, answer questions and that type of thing. But we're going to have a prayer together and have someone speak here in just a moment. And so we thank God for this. This is just the beginning. Again, I want to say to all of our folks who are joining us for the Shepherd Summit, you've been listening to these men serving God in world evangelism in unique places around the world. And you can help them. And you can also help Crown College. We're trying to train people. We now have over 5,000 graduates. They're on every continent. They're serving God in every state in America. And the Lord has done all this and we give him the glory for it. I want to ask a special youth group to come and sing now, if they would, please. And uh, we're thinking about the Lord's return. Gentlemen, thank you much. You may return to your seats. Wonderful. We'll hear from you again. Come on, girls. God bless you. May the Lord use your singing. And I've asked Dr. Matthew Whiteside to come immediately after this and to speak to us uh, about something that is pertinent to what all of us are doing in the matter of witnessing, confronting unbelief. And uh, this man is uniquely qualified with his work that he's been doing and has done in the field of science, in nanoscience, with a PhD from a renowned university. God gave him to us to head up our science department and he has a heart for preaching the word of God and seeing people saved. He's gonna come and help us with a message that will help all of us in just a moment after these girls give their song. God bless you. Oh. 
Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. I love this church. I love the pastor of this church. I love that God uses this church. And I love that this church is built on the foundation of the Bible. And therefore its function is foundational. Please open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20. Have you ever thought about how you think? Seriously, have you ever thought about how you think and why you think? We're all thinkers. Some of us are great thinkers. Some of us wish we could be great thinkers. But we all think. It's a thought process. It's something that God gave us and designed us with. And it's something the devil loves to take advantage of. He wants to be in your thoughts. He wants to control you. He wants to throw your function off. And how does he do it? He wants to be in your thoughts. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, it says, O oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith, Grace be with thee. Amen. Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, I love you. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for creating us in a way, Lord, that we're able to reason with you and think with you. And today, I pray that we truly do that. That we come together in one accord, one mind, your mind, and that we're able to hear directly from you, directly from your word. And that you use me, God. You speak through me. And that we leave changed. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. It's amazing to think about that the devil is after our thoughts. I love this verse because God used Paul as a spiritual father to speak to Timothy. And he says, keep that which is committed to thy trust. He says, Timothy, guard these things which have been given to you. Because there's people running around that believe lies lies. But where did those lies come from? You see, the devil is after our thoughts. Why? Because if he can confuse you, he can confuse what you believe to be true. And if he can confuse what you believe to be true, he can confuse what your function is. I want to do something a little unusual. I want us to, to take our bulletin that was given to us. Can you please do that with me? And just open it to the first page in the inside of your bulletin. And pastor says something here that really struck a chord with me when I read it. And if anyone in here has ever taken a science class, it probably struck a chord with you too. It says the local church is miraculous. When the Lord Jesus established the church in its foundation, he gave, all, he gave us all we need for its function. I would like you to do something. If you take notes, I would like you to simply write down foundation equals function. You know, this is a true statement that pastor reasoned through the Bible with to give us the function of the local church. It means that he looked in the word of God using observations. He read what he knew to be true. And he put them together in a logical format that he was able to say, this is the function of the local church. It's a local assembly of baptized believers that gather together to carry out the Great Commission. That's the function of the local church. He got that because he reasoned through the word of God to come to a conclusion using science. That's actually what science is. It's a way for us to logically think through something based on sets of observational facts. And that's a wonderful thing. It means that we can be given a list of facts and reason through them to come to a general conclusion about something. That's called inductive reasoning. That's called science. And God's given you the ability to reason through science. And that's a wonderful thing. When I think about this, and I think about this verse in science falsely so called, I often think that you are not alone in your thoughts. Think of it like this. If we could turn to Isaiah, please. Isaiah chapter 1. 
You're not alone in your thoughts. You see, in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is Isaiah 1 verse 18. And I love it because it doesn't say come tomorrow or come next week or come at some point. The Lord God literally says, come now and let us reason together. You know what that means? It means that God not only gave us the ability to reason, the creator God that created literally the entire universe spoke it into existence. He doesn't just give us the ability to reason. He wants you to reason with him. That's wonderful. If you go on to verse 19, it says, If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. What does this mean? It means God not only wants you to reason with him, but if you are willing and obedient, you'll be blessed. He'll direct your path. But if you refuse and rebel, it'll lead you to death. You know, this is echoed in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verses 5 through 7, we all know these verses saying that trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. What's understanding? It's the result of reason. We reason through something to gain an understanding of what's going on. It says lean not on thine own understanding and always acknowledge him and he shall direct those paths. It means that if you reason with God, he'll direct your paths. But in verse, in chapter 14 and verse 12, it tells us what happens if you don't reason with God. It says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. If you think about this in a logical reasoning format, if we just take God's word as the truth and we start to think through this with reasoning, we can start to realize God gave us reasoning. For what? Because he wants to reason with us. And if we reason with him, he'll direct your paths. He'll guide you. It literally says, the willing and obedient will be blessed. But if you don't reason with God, there are consequences. If you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured with the sword. You'll lead your own life to death, to spiritual death, to death, death. God wants to reason with you. You know, reasoning is what makes us human. Reasoning is what makes us human, our ability to understand. We all know the story of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. If you want to turn there, it's in Daniel chapter 4. We all know the story of Nebuchadnezzar. God called on him to glorify the Lord, the, the king of heaven, and he didn't. And all of a sudden, he ends up in the field behaving exactly like an ox. He ends up in a field behaving exactly like an ox. And in Daniel chapter 4, it says, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as an oxen. And his body was wet with dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned to me. In one verse, Nebuchadnezzar is literally acting like a cattle in the field. But when he comes back to being a human, the first thing he regains is his understanding. If you start to read a little further in verse 36, it says, At the same time, my reason returned to me. Your ability to reason and understand is what separates you from animals. It's something that God has given you to reason with him. And if you do, he'll direct your paths. And if you don't, you will lead yourself to death. That's absolutely true. Therefore, if we do reason with God, we can have our paths directed. Why is this important, you might ask? Like, why would we get up here and at a conference where we want to give the gospel, we want to fulfill the commission of the local church that has been called upon by Jesus Christ himself? 
why would we talk about reasoning? And it's because God doesn't just give you the ability to reason and want you to reason with him so he'll direct your path so you'll get the things in life that you think you want. It's because he uses this exact method to reason Christ to unbelievers. And if you'll go to the book of Acts, chapter 18, I just want to read something with you and then talk very personal with you about what I find to be true about God, what's real to me, what I know to be true about God. In the book of Acts, in chapter 18, we have Paul. And in verse 1, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, laid Lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought for their application, uh, occupation, they were tent makers. He found a common ground with some people because they were tent makers. In the next verse, it says what he did after getting that common ground. And he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. God's given you the ability to conduct science through inductive reasoning. It literally means observational reasoning. Something that you observe to be true, you can put together in a logical manner to be able to make decisions and lead others to the same logical conclusion. I grew up in a home where when I asked my dad something, he never gave me a direct answer. He gave me an encyclopedia. He gave me a dictionary. He showed me how to look up answers and reason through all the facts in hopes that I would come to the same conclusions that he did. He didn't get on Siri and say, hey Siri, tell me why dinosaurs um, grew to be so tall. You know, in today's days and age, we're starting to lose something that's very important that God gave us, and it's called critical thinking. It's called reasoning skills, because we expect direct answers given to us immediately. We don't want to do the research. We don't want to make it true for ourselves. We want to be things because other people are already them. Every year that I'm at the Crown College, somebody will come up to me, and they're like, you know what I realized today when I was sitting in class with Mr. Thomason? I realized why I'm a Baptist. They'll say that. They'll say, I always just assumed I was a Baptist because my parents were Baptists. But today, it became real to me. You want to know why it became real to them? Because they reasoned with God to understand the truth. And that's exactly what the devil wants to throw you off on. How does he do it? With science falsely so-called. Science falsely so-called. It's our responsibility in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, to guard the gospel and to keep pushing it forward, knowing that there's opposing forces using science falsely so-called. I love the word science. It's actually a Latin word that literally means knowledge. This means that there's a false knowledge that the devil uses to err people of the faith. What does that word err mean? It literally means this to have them follow a false path. It means the wrong path. The devil uses false science to lead people along the wrong path. I met a very interesting man a few months ago on a plane. He was a nuclear physicist from Oak Ridge National Labs. And I sat beside him on a plane. I was going down to Lake Texoma because God called me to give a message down there about creation science. I'm not called to be a pastor, but I can tell you this, I'm called to give the gospel. And I want to give it everywhere I go. And as I got on that plane, I made a deal with God, and my deal was this. God, I don't need anything in return, but every person I meet, I'm going to try to give the gospel to. And I pray you use it. They canceled 450 American airline flights that week. I landed on a layover. Actually, I was on my way to Brother Boyle's church in this particular instance. I landed on a layover in Texas, and on my way through Texas, I was getting on the plane here in Maryville, and this man got on board. I, there was me sitting, there was an empty seat, and there was another man sitting on my left. And this man got on board, and he had a giant mullet. 
it was this short in the front and it was this long in the back. But get this, it was permed. He had a perm mullet and he had a trucker's hat on and he had the most incredible shirt that I think I've ever saw. It said, I trust Dr. Seuss more than I trust Dr. Fauci. And I said, this guy's gonna be my friend. I said, Lord, Lord, please just have him sit next to me and I promise I'll give him your word. Just have him sit next to me. I don't care about this empty seat anymore. And you know what he did? He sat next to me and we started talking. We started talking. And he said, he said, oh, I just got here and I just got this job. You know, they're going to pay me a lot of money to come over here from California. I got a job at Oak Ridge National Labs. I'm a nuclear physicist. I'm going to be working on some stuff with nuclear weapons. I'm really excited about it. And I thought, that is really awesome. And he said, well, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm about to fly over to Washington and then go over to Montana. And I'm going to be speaking at a, cre- a Christian camp there uh, about science and the Bible. And he stopped and he stared at me. And he said, what kind of science? And I said, the only kind of science? The one kind? Are there multiple kinds? You see, that man and I had a conversation that day. And it was really difficult for me to find common ground with him. I'm glad he had that shirt on. We could agree on that. And that's where I started. And I spoke to him. And I said this, sir, the only kind of science. And he said, well, I don't think there is one only kind of science. And I said, what kind of scientist are you? And he said, I'm a nuclear physicist. And I said, that's pretty amazing. And I said, sir, did you know you and I are cousins? And he said, no, how am I your cousin? Because I can tell you this, we didn't have the same shade of brown skin. And I said, you and I are cousins. He goes, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, you know, science tells us that we're at least 50 second cousins. And I said, you know, that means we have a common ancestor. And when we started to look into this common ancestor in science, we found something very peculiar. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, have you ever heard of genetics? And he said, yes, of course I've heard of genetics. And I said, well, the same DNA structure that lets us know that somebody's somebody's father or not, or if they killed somebody, gives us the DNA sample to say that person's the killer, is the same DNA that we've used to find out that every single person in the world is at least 50 second cousins. And that makes you my cousin. I said, we're only 52 people apart. And he said, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And I said, absolutely, absolutely. And I said, you know what's really cool about that? I said, how many lineages do you think it backed up to? And he said, I don't know, thousands? And I said, well, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, they've all submitted these DNAs from all over the world. That means that we have people in Asia and Africa and North America, South America, Mexico, Europe, Eastern Europe, the Netherlands, everywhere has submitted DNA to 23andMe, Ancestry.com, the Human Genome Project. And do you know how many lineage they found of all these people? And he said, how many? And I said, just one. I said, you want to know what they call it? And he said, what do they call it? And I said, they call it the Adam and Eve genome. How convenient. I said, where do you think they got that from? I said, sir, I believe that the Bible is 100% true. And I believe the only way of salvation is through Jesus Christ because the Bible is 100% true. I said, we're all born sinners. I said, if Adam and Eve were real which science says they were, and the Bible has always said they were, then at some point, this perfect world we had became not so perfect. And he said, well, what do you mean by that? And I said, you're a physicist. Do you believe in the second law of thermodynamics? And he said, well, of course. The second law of thermodynamics states this, that all things in the entire world are constantly going from a state of order to disorder. Here's the funny thing, that's 100% opposite of evolution theory. Evolution theory says that everything came from crazy chaos and disorder and gained information through genetic mutations to gain order. But that's not what we've ever seen in modern genetics. And I told him this, and I said, you know, we're following the second law of thermodynamics, that God created a perfect world. And it was perfect in every way, and then something happened called entropy. In science, entropy would equal death and decay. And the wages of sin is what? Oh. And then something happened. See, if Adam and Eve were real, 
which science says they were, and the second law of thermodynamics is true, which science says it is, then it means at some point, everything that was perfect and in order started going towards disorder. The Bible says that evil men and seducers wax worse and worse. We're constantly going towards disorder, and it's going to end in total chaos. And I told him this. And I said, sir, but you're not alone. Even though Adam and Eve sinned against God, meaning they did something against God that he asked them not to do, and the wages of that sin was death, someone paid that price for you. And you can have refuge from death. You can live forever. Because our hope of glory is Christ Jesus. I told him this, and I said, the wages of sin is death, but Jesus Christ took on that payment for you. And he shed his blood on a cross, and he was buried in the graves, but he defeated death, making that payment for you. And rose again three days later, and is now sitting on the right hand of God the Father. And all you have to do, all you have to do is trust on him, and he'll save your soul. And that man stared at me dead in the eyes, and he said, that's your truth. And I said, you don't believe in an absolute truth? And he said, no, there are many truths. And I said, are you sure of that? And he said, yes, I'm absolutely sure. I said, are you certain? He says, I'm certain. And I said, are you absolutely sure? And he didn't answer me. And I told him, one day, sir, we can both agree, a storm will come into your life, and it will be the last storm. And the only thing that's going to save you, the only thing that's going to give you refuge is Jesus Christ. And he never said another word to me. Then the man sitting beside him laughed and leaned forward. And he said this, sir, I just heard everything that you just said to this man. He said, I'm a physicist at Oak Ridge too. And he said, I'm a Christian and I have many unsaved friends. And he said, everything you just said was 100% scientifically true. And it was also 100% biblically true. And he said, when I get back to work, I'm going to tell every single one of them about this. And I thanked him. And I went back to the airport, and I got delayed for two days. And while sitting in the airport, I called my wife, and I said, Honey, I've never had an airport ministry, but I'm about to start one. <laughs> and the next young man that came up to me, his name's Dalton, I told the exact same thing to. And he accepted Christ as a Savior. You might say, well, that's very unfortunate about that other man. You know, when we read the book of Acts, it turns out that when Paul preached and reasoned Christ in the synagogues, many people rejected him. And he would move on but pray for them, and sometimes he would come back and keep preaching it again. I have that man on a piece of paper, and every time I read it, I pray for him. You might ask yourself, why? Why? And it's because of this. One day, when I was very young, Someone put a little crack in the foundation of my life. See, I was told that everything you could ever know about life was found in the Bible. And as a four-year-old boy, I asked my Sunday school teacher, show me where the dinosaurs are. Because I loved dinosaurs. My little kid's starting to really love dinosaurs. He's two years old. And I'm going to show him where they are. But that's not what she told me. She said, don't worry about the front of the book. Just trust Jesus. And a little tiny piece of science, falsely so-called, was laid in the foundation of a four-year-old boy. And I went on to seek truth through the scientific method. My dad, you know, he didn't treat just me that way. He treated my three sisters that way, too. And two of them also became scientists and got PhDs and published novel research. He did something right. And when I was at the university working on my bachelor's degree, there was this young lady, and I used to always make fun of her because she would put her hands on tests when she would pray. And I would make fun of her for doing that. 
She'd put her hands on tests and pray to God to help her. And I would make fun of her for doing that. She would get in study groups and she'd hold hands with other people. And she would pray to God to help them study. And I would make fun of her for doing that. And one day, very kindly, she just said to me, you know what, Matthew? I love you and you're wrong about everything. There is a God in heaven. And he does love you. And he died on the cross for you. And he, you know what she said to me? She said, can you just agree with me that one day a final storm will come in your life? I said, yes, we can agree on that. I'll die. And she said, there's only one refuge from that storm. And it's trusting on the Lord Jesus Christ who paid the price for your sin and was buried and rose again. And I made fun of her for telling me that. But here's the thing. I'm pretty sure she's always prayed for me. Because 13 years later, that storm came into my life. And I was living in the Netherlands. And I came down from this water tower I was living in, and I collapsed in the street. I woke up in a hospital, and a doctor stared down at me and said, you must have some great purpose in this life because you should have just died. And she told me that I had a bilateral pulmonary emboli, which means I had blood clots in both of my lungs completely clogged up, and there no oxygen was getting in my blood. It was pumping all throughout my body. I collapsed in the street, and that 35% of all sudden deaths are from that happening in just one lung, and I had it in both. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me that science wasn't going to save me that day. I had no hope in science. Western medicine wasn't going to save me that day. I had no hope in Western medicine. The government surely wasn't going to save me that day. Some shot wasn't going to save me that day. And in desperation, because none of my friends showed up to the hospital that day, I threw my hands in the air laying in that hospital bed, and I just simply said this to God. I said, God, if you're real, just be real to me right now. And of all the famous people that have trained me, all the famous scientists that, whose names are written down in history books and they write the books that we teach. The ones that trained me, taught me how to be a great scientist. I didn't think of anything they told me encouraging that day. Of all the posters that I've seen that are very encouraging of kittens hanging from trees saying, just hang in there. I didn't think of that that day. When I asked God to be real to me, he gave me the truth. I thought of a girl that told me the gospel 13 years prior, and I rejected it. And I called out to Christ to forgive my sins laying in that hospital bed, and he did. And he did. But see, that's just where it all got started. Because when I asked him, what do you want me to do with my life? How do I reason with you? How do I get to know you better? I started reading the Bible. And as I started to reason with God, he told me this. I need you to quit science. And I did. I gave science to God. A very wise man once told me this. You can keep nothing unless you first give it to God. That man was Pastor Clarence Sexton. I gave science to God. Here's the thing. He gave it back. Just like in our life, we can think of everything like Abraham. It's either an Isaac or Ishmael situation with everything in your life, including what God wants you to do next. You can't keep anything in this life unless you first give it to God. Abraham gave Isaac to God, and God gave him back. But Abraham also gave Ishmael to God, who he was never supposed to have, and God kept him. Young people, older people, I want you to know this. As you're praying through this conference, as you're thinking about what does God have next for me to do, remember this, don't reason with yourself. Reason with God. I just want to end on this one question. What have we let get in the way of our reasoning with Christ? What blessings have you missed? because you haven't reasoned with God? What callings have you quenched in your life because you haven't reasoned with God? Let me ask you this last one. What people have you not 
given the gospel to because you listened to your own thoughts and talked your way out of it instead of reasoning with God. I often think this, what if that one girl never gave me the gospel? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Well, Dr. Matthew Whiteside is God's gift to us at Crown College and Temple Baptist Church. And his wife, Rachel, is God's gift to him. And she's a great girl. That's a great girl. I think in the sessions we have tomorrow, we'll have a, an added session on Ask Dr. Whiteside. And we'll have some people who have an interest or a snag they have that they need to get settled in the science matter. You may be a science teacher and people put that question to you, but we'll do that. Now I'm going to give you the list of sessions we're having on the college campus and when you decide that that's where I'm going to go, I want you to leave now when you decide. All right, make your way to the college campus. It's 1,200 feet from here. I suggest you don't walk it. But uh, by the way, we're putting sidewalks in and bike trails in from the church uh, to the college campus, and that's going to be a great thing. But I'm going to help you now. So let's, let's start here. There's a session for pastors and church planters in room 120. How many of you think you're going to be in that? Would you raise your hand? I'll, I'll be leading it. Good. Then I want you to leave now and find your way to 120. Just excuse yourself now. Very good. There's a session for lessons I have learned being a pastor's wife. My wife is conducting that. And there are a lot of you girls who are going to be pastor's wives someday. And some of you are pastor's wives now. How many of you are going to be there? Would you raise your hand? Good, then I want you to leave and go find the friendship hall, the friendship hall for you folks. Now, there's a session on local church music ministry, and we have been blessed with some fantastic people doing that. And that's your interest. Would you raise your hand? Good, good. Then I want you to find room 101, 101 if you'll do that now. Now listen to this carefully. There's a session on gospel media, building a Baptist Friends Network, or gospel media, and we've got a young lady, Faith Lutz, who's gonna be leading that. She's the girl who put the video together that you saw about the, the, the Teens for Christ, all those things. How many of you have an interest in getting God's word out in media and God's message out that way. Would you raise your hand? Good, good. Then I want you to be there and she and Jessica Jones are going to have that in room 111, 111. Just leave now, please, and head to 111. By the time I finish, we're going to empty this auditorium, so you have to decide to do something, all right? Reaching children with the gospel. Reaching children with the gospel. And... Um, my friend, Ab Thomas, is working with that. I believe there may be a room change there. So I'm going to leave that. You have the room change. Good. Somebody will shout it out to me in just a moment. Reaching children with the gospel. That's your interest. Would you raise your hand? And Ab is, is the greatest guy I know in the world working with children. Room 110. Good, good strong voice, too. Thank you. Children with the Gospel, room 110. Thank you, Michael. Beginning a Bible club in your public school. I don't know how you could be through the meeting last night and not say, I'm going to do that. Beginning a Bible club in the public school. Would you raise your hand, please? And the people who know how to do that and help you do it are in room 131. Room 131. If you could just find your way there. Room 131. Start a Collegiates for Christ University ministry. This is a marvelous thing. The fields are white into harvest. You, the university ministry, 
Good. Raise your hands, please. That's room 132. Reaching senior age adults with the gospel in senior residence centers and other means, getting a ministry to senior adults and wonderful people working there in room 133. Would you find that? Room 133. Now, some of you are going to have to get to moving pretty quickly where you're going to go and uh, no, no lingering around here. We're not going to allow you to stay in this room and we're not going to allow you to be between this building and the college campus. You're going to have to get on your horses and get there. All right? The Global Sunday School. Now, that is a unique ministry. And you can go to Sunday School anywhere in the world and we're going to show you how to do it having a global Sunday school, room 134, 134. Would you leave now? Good, very good. Beginning a school of the Bible, we have 120 of them going on now. We want to show you how you can start a school of the Bible in room 100, excuse me, in room one, uh, 200, room 200, school of the Bible, room 200. New Testament Church Pioneers, Mr. Zinker is going to be there with the people you heard at the giving the lecture here earlier. And uh, they'll be in room 210, room 210. Take your young people and people to a crown camp. You may want to go all about, know all about Montana or Texoma or Camp Victory or Mount Moriah. All right, room 220. Room 220, good. Crown Global is advancing your knowledge of God and ministry opportunity, and that's why we can help you do that, get to the next level. And it's in the admissions lobby in the college campus, just right inside the college campus in the admissions lobby on the right. And our people who work with Crown Global will help you there. Now, I'm going to have to dismiss myself and get to a meeting I'm conducting. So I'm happy all of you are here. Good. And we've got the canine specialist here, right? Good. Um, how to treat a dog bite is in. <laughs> you tell us the room. I hope you've enjoyed being here, fellas. I'm going to get a ride down to. You're going to be my ride? Good. <laughs>